This is Success Stories, a program of the Sorrell College of Business at Troy University. I'm Alan Mendenhall, Associate Dean of the Sorrell College of Business and Executive Director of the Manuel H. Johnson Center for Political Economy. Success Stories is a program that highlights the lives and careers of people who have accomplished great things. And my guest today is Dr. Stanley Kurtz, a senior fellow at the Ethics and Public Policy Center. Stanley, great to have you here today. Alan, thanks so much for having me. Well, you wrote an article this week for National Review titled, Can Utah Save America's Universities? What was that article about? Uh, well, Alan, um, a bill has just been introduced in the Utah State Legislature, uh, which I think will be transformative when it comes to higher education. The bill was inspired by model legislation that I co-authored uh, along with um, authors from the Martin Center for Academic Renewal. That's a think tank in North Carolina uh, dedicated to higher education. And also an author from the National Association of Scholars, which is a great group of academics who are also mm, concerned about the direction higher education has taken in the last 20 or 30 years. Now, I've been writing about higher education for uh, about 25 years uh, publicly, uh, I guess 24 years. And um, usually uh, people like myself who are dissatisfied with the direction of higher education are restricted to complaints. <laughs> uh, more recently, uh, I've begun to author model legislation and state legislatures have taken a real interest in changing higher education. But to be honest, most of the proposals out there, including my own, have been tinkering around the edges. It's tough to make a systemic change in higher education, at least legislatively. Uh, but the General Education Act, which is the name of the model bill that I and my co-authors have authored, really would transform higher education, really would set it on a new basis. And the General Education Act does three big things. First, it has the legislature mandate a course of graduation requirements. We call that general education, the courses you have to take if you want to graduate. Uh, and right now, students have to take various courses in order to graduate. But the requirement doesn't mean much because there is a kind of smorgasbord of 100, 200, sometimes 300 courses for the students to choose from. Everything from hyper-specialized courses on whatever their professor happens to be working on at the moment to um, Taylor Swift studies <laughs> type courses. And um, the, in contrast, the General Education Act uh, mandates a, a really classic liberal arts curriculum history of Western civilization, uh, great books of philosophy and literature from the West, uh, traditional American history, a great American civics course, courses in the uh, great art and music uh, of the Western tradition. And pretty much every student has to take those courses, the same body of courses in order to graduate. That would be really new. Or to put it another way, that would be really old. <laughs> because this is how you, America's universities worked, really, for the whole history of the country, running right through the middle of the 20th century. It's only in the last few decades that we've broken with that tradition. So this would restore classic liberal education. But that's only part one, so to speak. Uh, because the truth is that. Uh, no matter how good the courses are that you recommend, if the current faculty teaches those courses, they won't really be teaching traditional general education. What faculty tend to do nowadays is to deconstruct uh, the authors that they're teaching. So if they assign Aristotle, maybe they'll talk about the fact that slavery existed in the time of the ancient Greeks. So maybe we shouldn't pay too much attention to what Aristotle has to say to us. Traditional general education looks as, at these great books as something that potentially have lessons for us now, no matter when they were written, no matter the failings of uh, that era, 
and even the failings of the author. Karl Marx wrote a great book, you know, a series of great books, and uh, I don't agree with them, but I acknowledge their greatness, and they have something to teach us, if only learning from some of the errors uh, that Marx made. And, and so on with many authors uh, who many of us feel more positively about than Marx. And so classic general education uh, offers these great books, takes them seriously, and puts them into a kind of dialogue with each other across the ages. So you might have a dialogue between Adam Smith and Karl Marx. What would they say to each other? How would they critique each other? Or between Aristotle as an ancient and John Locke as a modern, uh, or between Edmund Burke as one of the founding conservatives uh, and, um, and one of the great founding liberals like Locke or, um, or any n a number of other, other people. And so um, the General Education Act sets up an independent school of general education within the university and gives it the authority to hire faculty who have expertise in and commitment to the uh, teaching philosophy of traditional general education. So those are the first two things. We've got a, a new curriculum, which is really an old curriculum, and we begin to hire faculty who believe in the great books approach to teaching that kind of curriculum. The third leg of the triangle is uh, cutting some existing programs and faculty, and of course that's going to be controversial. But uh, it is permitted to do something called program discontinuance, that is the shutting down of an entire department when, for example, a school faces which, what's called financial exigency. In other words, we've run out of money. We don't have the money to support all the departments that we used to, and so we're going to cut some, maybe a humanities department typically is what would get cut. But it's not well known, but also the case that if a school um, uh, fundamentally changes its educational mission and strategy, uh, it is allowed to do program discontinuance. And there could be no greater change of uh, educational mission and strategy than a return to tr tr traditional general education. So our model legislation and the Utah bill that was inspired by it do all three of these things. And if you think about it, it's really very simple. You get maybe 30 or 40 percent of the curriculum is, is new in an old sort of way. And then you maybe bring on 20 or 30 percent of a new faculty to teach it. And you shut down some of the existing departments, maybe to the extent of 10, 20, 30 percent. And you've got a transformed university. One objection I might anticipate is that, well, students don't want to read the great books, but I think that is incorrect. There's a reason why the great books address perennial themes, because the, these themes actually are perennial. The, the biggest questions involving the human condition continue to pop up generation after generation after generation. I actually read an article this very morning in the College Fix about the Lyceum Scholars Program at Clemson University, which is run by Bradley Thompson, Brad Thompson. And the article was detailing how many applications that that program gets every year from undergraduate students. And every year the applications go up and up and up and up. And there's a demand for this type of education. There's a hunger for the great books. Absolutely, Alan. And I think people often don't understand how accessible so many of the great classics are. You take, for example, Plato's Apology, which is the apology of Socrates. Plato is describing the trial of his teacher, Socrates. Um, this is about the most accessible book you could ever imagine. It's very exciting. Socrates is on trial for his life for having undermined the uh, religious beliefs of, this, uh, of Athens, this ancient Greek society. And um, what's going to happen? How does Socrates defend himself? He's speaking to the general public. It's easy to understand his words. It's a dramatic situation. And yet the, the underlying issues <coughs> are as profound as you would ever want to 
run across. And this is, this is true with many, uh, maybe most of the great books. Of course, there are some readings that are more challenging than others, but the readings can be pitched to the level of uh, the students. And, uh, and students, when they really get engaged, uh, will be surprised at how much they can handle. And they do get engaged because when you're in a school uh, that teaches traditional liberal education in the traditional way, what you find is, and, and crucially, let me add, that all the students are essentially taking the same coursework. That's when you get them arguing long into the night in their dormitories about wh whether Adam Smith or Karl Marx was right and what they would say to each other, et cetera, et cetera, because they know that everyone has taken essentially the same course. So students get hooked in. And uh, I studied the process by which the uh, Western civilization requirement at Stanford University was eliminated back in the 1980s. Uh, that was the dispute that, that made the controversy over general education famous. Uh, uh, Jesse Jackson famously led the chant, hey, hey, ho, ho, Western Civ has got to go. And, um, and uh, now I just lost track of, uh, <laughs> I just lost my thought there. Well, that's okay. It's it's yeah. a good it's a good time to ask about you yeah. anyway. I want to I want to talk about your role at the Ethics and Public Policy Center. I mentioned already that you are a senior fellow there, and you work in policy. You do a lot of writing. You're a contributing editor at the National Review. What was the path that led to this role? Well, as I grew up, I was liberal. I would say I was a standard issue, conventional American political liberal. But I was also a classical liberal in the sense that I really was into John Stuart Mill without ever having read John Stuart Mill. I believed in, in the idea of learning both sides of the issue, having a genuine debate, having freedom of speech. I was pretty nerdy when I was growing up. I was probably the only private individual other than a library who subscribed to vital speeches of the day. I would live, there used to be this thing where they would reprint, you know, speeches. Now we have YouTube and whatnot. I would literally read things on both sides, and I made a point of subscribing to a liberal uh, magazine and a conservative magazine. My father subscribed to a lot of ma political magazines, so I guess I was imitating him, except I insisted that I should uh, read both sides. And, um, so as I went through high school, the 60s broke out, and uh, there was a protest against the Vietnam War called the Moratorium. It was a day on which everyone who was against the Vietnam War was supposed to go on strike. And my high school had a chapter, believe it or not, my high school had a chapter of the Students for a Democratic Society, the SDS. So the head of the SDS in my high school wanted all the students to walk out of the school on moratorium day. And I was against that uh, because it was illegal. Uh, and so I suggested uh, to the great frustration of the head of the SDS that instead the school uh, suspend classes and go to the auditorium and listen to a debate in which liberals and conservatives would debate both sides of the Vietnam War. And the SDS guy hated that, but that actually won the day. The principal went along with it, even though it suspended classes, because it saved the school from a walkout. Uh, and little by little, I was getting alienated from the left uh, through that experience and others. Later, when I was in academia, to skip far ahead, uh, I had gotten my doctoral degree. And, in uh, social anthropology. In social correct. anthropology. And I was teaching at Harvard University, and I told my fellow teachers this story. I told them the story about me and the, the SDS guy in my high school. And they all were like, yeah, we all had problems with people like you. They had all been SDS people. And I was at war with them because they wouldn't allow any conservative books into the curriculum. By then I'd become conservative To I skipped over a lot, but really it was Alan Bloom's book, The Closing of the American Mind, 
and just living within academia and its extremism and one-sidedness that kept driving me to the right. And then I read Alan Bloom's book. And so I was at war uh, with my fellow teachers in this program at Harvard University over the curriculum. And I realized at one point that they were all like the SDS guy and none of them really believed in true liberalism, in classical liberalism. And uh, that's a short version of what set me on my path. Well, when you were teaching at the University of Chicago, because you did teach uh, for a period at the University of Chicago, did you teach with Alan Bloom? Were you friends with Alan Bloom? Did you talk to Alan Bloom? Or was he in a different circle while you were there? He was in a different circle, but I idolized him. And I wanted to go to him, but I was afraid. Because if the people in my program knew that I was working with Alan Bloom, I worried that it could destroy my career. And then, you asked a good question, and then Bloom died. He died of cancer. And, um, and uh, so I never got to meet him. But I made a joke to his friends after he had died because I believe, this is half joking, I believe that I made Alan Bloom famous and rich because I so loved the closing of the American mind that at the time I plotted to make him the number one book in the country because there was a bookstore, Harvard bookstore, which was on the feeder list to the New York Times bestseller list. And I strategically went and started buying copies of the closing <laughs> of the American mind as he was climbing up the list. Now something tells me he would have been climbing up the list regardless. But I went to his, the executors of his estate at Chicago after he died, told them the story and demanded a share <laughs> of the estate. And for some reason they refused. They didn't give it to you. No. How about that? <laughs> what made you leave higher education or leave not higher ed, but leave academia, leave the university setting? Well, I ran into the same kind of roadblock that many conservative uh, people run into. I just told you that when I was at Harvard, I was at war with my fellow teachers. So I at that point, it became obvious that I was not on board with the typical leftist perspective. And uh, that got around. And I got uh, very close to uh, a number of great jobs. And uh, I was blocked. I could have kept trying. I had a good record. I had a you know, teaching experience at Harvard and a published book and all sorts of things. And I could have could have uh, probably stayed within academia, it's hard to say. But uh, there were a lot of people who were not happy with what I had fought, how I had fought for the curriculum at Harvard. And I began to know people who had moved into the world of think tanks uh, in, in Washington. And I thought, well, I won't have to censor myself like I did when I couldn't go to Alan Bloom, because increasingly I wanted to write about public controversies or even controversies over academia. Uh, and I knew that I wouldn't be able to, that I'd already gotten in trouble for fighting that fight. And I'd, I'd only get into more trouble if I continued. So I actually felt I'd had more academic freedom outside of academia than inside. Well, you mentioned earlier the General Education Act and being a co-author of that. But you co-authored a piece of model legislation a few years back on freedom of speech at universities. And if I'm not mistaken, that was the model bill that was introduced here in Alabama. Yes, and I, uh, I testified uh, at both the House and the Senate on that uh, legislation, which was inspired by my model bill. That was the first model bill I wrote. And you know, I had been writing for National Review about higher education for 15 years. And I thought at the time, oh, I must be having a huge effect, you know? Here I am writing, and I'm on the internet, and it's all wonderful. <coughs> and then one day, in 2015, uh, I had an experience that totally turned me around. This was um, when the big controversy happened at Yale University, when a young uh, student berated uh, Nicholas Christakis over his wife's email about Halloween costumes. It was a famous controversy. But the sa something else happened on that same day. There was a conference on free speech 
held by the William F. Buckley Society, Conservative Student Society. And um, that conference was disrupted by Yale students. This was a conference on free speech that was disrupted. And I was shocked by that. It happened on the same day as the Christakis incident. And I said to myself, no, something is going on here. Because in the past, no self-respecting student would want themselves to be seen as shutting down free speech, much less a conference about free speech. Uh, sure, there had been shout-downs before, but not that many, and most of them were focused at a specific speaker for a specific issue. To shut down a conference about free speech, that was surprising. Today, we wouldn't bat an eyelash, but back then, I decided that everything I'd written for 15 years had been useless. <laughs> <laughs> That, uh, you know, if this is what's happened to the Academy, after 15 years of writing, I'm obviously doing something wrong. And that's when uh, I sort of suspended things and thought about what I should do and came up with the idea of writing model state-level legislation because public universities are controlled by state legislatures. And that's what set me on the path of writing model legislation. And do you enjoy do you enjoy that do you enjoy that because you're still very active a very active writer for national review i mentioned already you're a contributing editor and you write for popular publications all the time do you enjoy writing model legislation is that i do yeah. it's fun it's a challenge uh yeah uh you have to think a certain way you have to read the phrase and imagine uh, all the different interpretations that could be put on it, all the different problems it would raise. It's a different kind of thought uh, than academic thinking related. Obviously, it's a more lawyerly way to think, but there's something special about actually writing the laws instead of arguing them. Uh, I just, I took to it, and I, I hope I'm getting better at it as time goes on. What did you study at Haverford? I know the social anthropology is what, what you earn your doctorate in, but what did you study when you were an undergraduate? I was a religion major. Okay. Uh, not uh, religion in the sense of going to divinity school and being religious, but comparative religion. Comparative religion. I started out focusing on um, Old Testament, but I grew more interested in um, other religions and in the social scientific study of religion. Uh, and I eventually went into anthropology. Because of that, I focused on anthropology of religion. Well, and I read somewhere that you did field work in India for your doctorate. Yes. What was that about? Well, the, the subject of my doctorate was the, uh, the cult of a new goddess a new goddess. There was a Hindu goddess. The Hindus say that they have 333 million gods, meaning an infinite number. And uh, the pantheon changes, and a new goddess named Santoshima had attained immense popularity throughout India, chiefly because of a film about her. Uh, India has a large film industry. You must have heard the term Bollywood. Bollywood, of course. Because Bombay is the headquarters. I, I took a Southeast Asian film and literature course as an undergraduate. We watched a lot of Bollywood. So they have a genre of film there called mythological films, where they put on religious stories. And they had the story of this goddess's myth, and it became a smash hit. It was like the top grossing film of the decade in India. But there must have been something about this goddess, I thought, uh, that uh, would explain why she was so popular. So that's what I focused on, and I went to her various temples. I also studied Indian families. I related the idea of these mother goddesses in India to the distinctive way that children were raised by multiple mothers in a joint family in India. So that was the focus of my work. And are you living in Washington, D.C. right now? Is that yes. where you are? Yes, okay. I live in Washington. By the way, I should add, to connect this back to the General Education Act, I am in favor of the study of other cultures, and the General Education Act includes the study of other cultures. Now, it's overwhelmingly about the West. I think we need to understand our own culture first and foremost, 
because we're living here and this is who we are, because we can't even understand different cultures until we understand our own. But being in favor of studying the West and giving primacy to the West in college does not mean that you don't believe in studying other cultures. Well, and the so-called Western canon holds within it no small degree of internal critique, and you have numerous figures, just a Spinoza, for example, who are considered transgressive for their era, but as time goes by, they come to be seen as part of a longer, broader tradition, even if they're underappreciated in their era. And I think that lesson in itself merits the study of something like the Western canon. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Well, Stanley, I have really enjoyed having you on the show. Thank you for coming down all the way from Washington, D.C. It's been great to hear from you. This has been Success Stories, a program of the Sorrell College of Business. Until next time. Mm -hmm.